All right, got to turn the basketball brain off and get back into hockey. Leafs tonight. Brube against his old team. Revenge game, money on the board game. Big one. I'll tell you this right now. I just did It's Early, but with the NBA. I'm throwing a quadruple down It's Early, but on this Leafs game tonight. The Leafs, after that effort against Columbus, you get away with one, right? Everybody was like, teehee. No biggie. You played hard the night before. You had Hill to be in net. They were sleepy. They were a little bunch of sleepy guys. It's okay. If you show up with a poor effort this evening and you do it against your former coach's team that fired him again quickly after winning a Stanley Cup, not good. You have a bad performance tonight. I'm not even talking wins and losses, right? Like we all know this is a process still, right? This is process versus results and yeah, results matter. Don't get me wrong, but process is important here too. But you get dog walked, you get embarrassed tonight, and all the goodwill that you've built from the beginning of the season, it's out of here. <laughs> it's gone. I'm going to bury them on Leafs talk tonight. Uh, and as anybody who covers this team should, because this one matters more 100%. If the Barube effect matters, then the team in front of them has to play like a Barube team. They got to work their asses off and they got to get back in the good graces this evening. Uh, James Myrtle, senior writer for the Athletic Journal. Right now, what's up, brother? How are we doing? I'm good. I'm good. There's breaking news. The Leafs have just activated Joseph Wool from yeah. IR, and it sounds like he's going to play tonight. So, mm. Mm. interesting, interesting stuff. Throwing him right in against Brubay's team. Okay. Um, okay. Let me let me collect my thoughts on that. Let me collect some thoughts. What do you think <laughs> about my take about how tonight matters more? Do you think it does? Because people do the measuring stick game and. Normally, it's against an opponent that you could face in the postseason or one of the teams that was the best in the NHL. This is a Blues group that just lost Robert Thomas. I think the Leafs are something close to like minus 250 favorites on the betting line. And granted, some of that's because they're the Leafs. But yeah, how much stock do you put into a game like this? Some money on the board game for the brand new coach? Yeah, I think so. I think hmm. that this means something for sure. And you're going to have, it sounds like you're going to have Wall back and St. Louis has played pretty well and you're coming off what they hope is one of the crappiest games that they're going to play all year on, mm -hmm. on Tuesday. So it's a statement to the coach. I'm sure the, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall the last two days of what Brube has been saying to his team about that game and mm. adjustments that they're going to make. It wouldn't surprise me if there's a surprise scratch or two for this game tonight, just to send a message and say, Hey, last game wasn't acceptable. And yeah, I think you combine all of those, all of those things. And I think that, uh, I think tonight does mean something more. Well, the only thing with the scratches is, is Pacioretty healthy enough to play? Because I would guess that they're going to be uber cautious with that, which removes one of the guys from the equation. And I don't think that Timothy Lilligren is drawing in because he's bad and the other guy's been playing well. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just hard for me to see a lot of shake up there. Yeah, I was just, yeah, I was wondering about Pontus Holmberg. It's yeah. interesting he's played every single game because he's also been bad. Yeah, so, quite. you know, um, that was that was one possible change I was thinking maybe they could make and camp comes back in. Yeah, no, camp's got to come back in. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, okay, so I've figured out my questions on wool and the, the the thoughts. Like I was sitting there, I was collecting. All right, I was still listening to you, but I was also collecting. Two things. This means two games off in a row for Stolars. And I just read 32 Thoughts yesterday uh, evening when Elliot Freeman dropped it, and he put in there his Leafs thought, which was about Stolars's workload. And it's not um, customary for a guy who's playing as well as he is to sit two nights in a row. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on what the Leafs plan is moving forward. If any of his recent play, how good he's looked in that starters role will be altered, like the plan for his workload moving forward, or if that is actually a real concern within the organization beyond the natural feelings that you would have about a guy who's only played 28 games. Yeah, I think both Wall and Stolarz, they have the same questions as everybody else about the fact that, that they haven't played full seasons. I mean, you know what's interesting with Stolarz is if you look back, he didn't play a full season as in junior. He only did it in the minors, I think, maybe twice, and he's never done it in the NHL. Mm -hmm. And here's a guy who's 31 years old in January. So he's been playing high-level hockey for you know, 15 years, and he hasn't played 40-plus games in a season very often at all. So, you know, with that kind of a track record, with the injury history that he has, it makes sense. And the, the thing I would say about not playing tonight is Wool's back. It's a really heavy week with the four games in six days. 
it's not this. I mean, he Stolarz played Monday and and played great. It's not that big of a break to wait until Saturday, and obviously the the game against Boston is going to be a big one on Saturday. Mm-hmm. No, it's it's not that big of a break, and the con, the schedule actually stays really heavy the following week too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like they play tonight, and you mentioned they play Saturday, but then they're playing I think Monday, Monday. Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday is the next week. So it's like they're packing in a ton of games here. So. I guess I won't read too much into the idea of a split um, moving through that portion of the schedule between the two guys. But the real curiosity to me is if Stolarz continues to play this way, this well, and Wool doesn't look as great, whether there's actually pressure on Joe Wool, whether he could actually miss um, some, some time that he would have normally have gotten in the net because the other guy's just out playing him and they alter that plan. If that's even something that's on the table at this point of the season. Yeah. I, I think in an ideal world they don't want either guy to play more than forty some games. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't I don't think no matter how well Stolarz plays, I don't think he's getting up to the fifty mark. Mm-hmm. So you know, but I again it's gonna depend on play as well. I mean if Stolarz yep. continues to be a nine I mean what's his save percentage now, nine forty something? I mean no, I, no, that's, no. That, that's he's the darling of the but... fan base. He's honestly the maybe yeah. if you want to talk about like most popular athletes that I always do approval rating, not most popular because he's not famous enough, but I always do approval rating on a player right now. He's, he's a hundred percent approval rating. Like what, who's, who's saying that they don't like uh, Anthony Stolarz in the city right now. Who's aware he exists. Not a person. Yeah, and just wait till like more of his backstory comes out too. Cause like, you know, I know like I've, I've heard some of the stuff and I know we're working on a story and like, it's, it's, it's pretty Pretty good. I was talking to Dallas Aikens who had him in in Anaheim, and he just mm-hmm. said this guy's an amazing guy. Mm-hmm. The the team, the players love to play for him, and so you know he's going to be if he continues to play like this, he's going to be uh, he's going to climb the climb the fan favorite charts here pretty quickly in Toronto. Buddy, we're way too close to the U.S. election. Like I think it's November fifth. It's October twenty fourth. That for you to be going wait till things come out about his backstory. I was like that. My brain's geared politically where I was like, Oh, uh, oh good what? Good, <laughs> yeah. Good, good thing. Thing. way you good said it, Man, you know, like working yeah. class, New Jersey sure. back, background, okay, like, good. you know, just unassuming yeah. kind, affable guy. Like I, you know, I've been around a team and he just, he just yeah. seems like a, a, a great guy who is finally getting a break. And those mm. are the kind of stories that I think this city loves. Yeah. Okay. So not scandal. Good, good. Scared. A lot of people there. Things are about to come out. You're like, what? <laughs> it's like, okay. So uh, I guess the, the final thought on that is then if they don't want either guys playing more than 40 games and then you kind of have a plan set in place. Sure. The one guy might end up playing some of the bigger contests, the more high leverage contests and, and establish himself sort of as the one a, uh, the fan base will certainly feel that and be critical of one of the guys if they're not performing particularly well. That's just natural. But if you're able to tune that out, it shouldn't be as big of a deal. And some guys are adept at that. And Wool, from the things I've heard about him anyways from people around him, is he's especially good at that. Like, he's not a let the outside noise guy in, which I yeah. think really bodes well for him in his future with the Leafs. But it seems to me then, if that is the case, that there's actually very little pressure out on him outside of you know his own personal expectations and the team's expectations. Yeah, I think that that's right. Yeah. No, yeah, Wool's a guy that's not on social media, and he's at home yeah. building Lego sets yeah. and playing yeah. playing the piano and yeah. stuff like that. Like that's who he is. Yeah, he's got real hobbies. Like he doesn't. His <laughs> hobbies aren't scrolling like most of us. Like, what do you do with your free time? I scroll. They're like, oh, I'm also a scroller. I doom scroll for hours at a time. <laughs> yeah. So I, that's why I do feel like he's in a good position that way. But yeah, it doesn't look like he's at a risk to be losing meaningful playing time. No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I don't. Asking about the split, I mean, I think they'd still like to be pretty close to fifty-fifty, but mm-hmm. we'll see if everybody's healthy the rest of the way, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I expect the number three. I expect we'll see Matt Murray at some point. We'll mm-hmm. probably see Hill to be again at some point. Most teams end up using three, four goalies throughout mm-hmm. the year, so it's not going to be smooth sailing the whole way. Yeah, I would think that that actually is the only meaningful takeaway outside of being excited about Stolarz from the beginning of the season is that. That last hill to be game, I would have to guess it was, hey, we need him to be playing games in the AHL. It's not like, hey, we don't believe in him anymore to play in an NHL game in a pinch, but more so like a reminder of the development he needs and that Matt Murray would be now the firmly back entrenched as the number three. Yeah, they didn't want to bring Murray up. They had a decision to make with when when Wool went down. They didn't want to bring Murray up and have him sit on the bench because he's coming off those surgeries and they want him to play. and. Yeah. He he had I think I think he's played two games for the Marlies now in, in his last game his first game was just so so and his last game was really good mm-hmm. so 
you know, Murray's got to get some reps down in the AHL. But yeah, I mean, I think for future call-ups, it very well could be Murray who comes up and uh, gets the spot starts on the back-to-backs. I never know this stuff because it feels like oftentimes uh, camps and guys around the guy are usually excited about the dude's incoming season, right? Uh, like, look at the stuff that was surrounding Pacioretty as he was trying to become a Maple Leaf. Like, this is the best shape he's ever been in. Like, you always get that kind of stuff. But there was some, like, some Murray excitement did trickle my way throughout the offseason of this guy looks better and healthy and all that different stuff. And again, I take it with a grain of salt, but it was there. Well, I mean, he's not that old of a yeah. guy. I think I think yeah. he's 31 years old, and he was a really, really good goalie for a while there. So, mm-hmm. you know... It, it could. There have been goalies that have come back from the double hip surgery and have, have played pretty well. So yeah. we'll see. I mean, he, he's he's a, another guy, he's a wonderful person, an interesting guy. There's a lot there, and it would be pretty great if he could battle back and, and get back in the NHL. And um, you know, even if he's a backup or something like that, it would be a good story. So here's a real pressure point, in my opinion. Um, it's how far away is Cali Yarncroc? Is your understanding of it? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know on that one. I haven't yeah. poked around on that at all. Okay, because um, as the days go on here, I like they keep cycling. You mentioned the Pontus Holmberg thing, right? And I'm going, yeah, for sure. Like Pontus has not been playing well. Uh, and David Camp comes out. And Pacioretty's an older player who has been taken out of the lineup because he hasn't looked phenomenal, but also they want to rest him. And now he's dealing with an injury. And so it doesn't feel like really there's anything urgent um, for Nick Robertson. But he scores this goal against Columbus. And... <laughs> The goal was nothing to me. Like, I, I, I don't know. Maybe players feel differently. Maybe he feels differently, like that he has the monkey off his back and he doesn't have to just sit there with the zero the entire time. So, yeah, from the outsider perspective or when you're looking at a box score perspective, it looks better than the zeros. There's no doubt about it. But if you're paying attention to the team, his impact has been minimal so far this season. And I would actually argue that a big part of, and I have argued this pretty firmly throughout the beginning of the season, that... Tavares is playing fine, that people who are crying about him are just the ones that will never get off of the $11 million number and the disappointment of the contract and blah, 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 blah. But you can't really expect much from a line or at least to have them look phenomenal when, yeah, an aging player like Tavares is saddled with two wingers that don't have any impact or don't drive any play. And I think that the expectation or at least the hope for Robertson this season was that he was at times going to drive play. And there were moments, right? Like in game one of the season where he was doing that, where he was dangerous, he felt dangerous and he was carrying the puck through the neutral zone, gaining, you know, felt like he was skating better, felt like he was looking for a shot a little bit more that he was threatening. And the last little bit, the the threatening parts haven't felt there outside of the ends of these last two games, which have been blowouts. And I am kind of curious what you think, it's it's going to happen here because my guess would be that when Cali Yarncroke comes back, if he doesn't play center between Domi and Nylander, which is a Versteeg idea that I, I genuinely don't hate them taking a look at it, that the most natural fit to me for a line that is somewhat capable would either be that situation. You bump McMahon down with Tavares and Pacioretty and you're kind of big, or you put Yarncroke with those two guys and you've got a little bit more of a responsible veteran line. Yeah, I, I think that that makes sense. I could see Yarncock going there for sure, especially as he's just coming off the injury and has missed training camp and all mm. that. So you're probably not going to put him in the top six to start. So No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, in the other thing too, you know, they're going to have too many forwards probably. Someone's going to have to go on waivers here. I mean, depending on the health of Pacioretty and, and everything like that. So mm. Seems he's fine. Hackenpah actually looks like, to me, looks like he's getting closer than yarn croc just because I've, you know, I've seen Hakapa on the ice and around the, mm. the team, a little bit of practice and things like that. But yeah, when yarn croc comes back, that makes sense. I mean, he's a guy that can help you on the penalty kill and he's a guy that can, can, can play spot minutes, especially when you've got a lead and you're trying to hold things down. And so, you know, he's another utility player that they need. And you're right. Robertson's been a bit of a ghost. You know, it reminds me there were long stretches last year where you just didn't notice him and mm-hmm. he's getting 11 minutes and, and maybe a shot on goal, or, you know, but sometimes not. And, you know, just not seeing a lot from him. So, I mean, he, if it continues to go this way, he'll, he will move his way onto the potential trade candidate list, which up until now, after what, what Robertson was on that list going into training camp, mm-hmm. he played his way off of it. And the list, you know, at the start of the season was was Lilgren number one, Camp number two, maybe Yarncroc, 
but I think that, you know, Robertson, and I know Robertson doesn't have a big salary, but, yeah. you know, if, if he's got two points in the first 18 games or something like that, I could see them just looking at that and like, there's just, it's not working here. Yeah, but I don't think the issue normally would be, or uh, that it would be a normal player, you would go, yeah, he's going to come out of the lineup. He's going to sit for a few games. He'll get his opportunity. He's a younger guy, blah, 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 blah. With him, it just the only reason that it feels like he would be tracking back towards the trade list that you mentioned is because he's going to be very dissatisfied with the idea of sitting. And if he does, in fact, sit, right, it doesn't seem as though the path for him to get back on the ice is anything other than an injury, which to, to me, if I'm him, is like that's not a palatable situation. It's not like the no, fourth he, line guys where they're cycling in and out of the lineup. You know what I mean? Yeah, he's not going to want to sit for very long. Yeah. But I don't know how he or his camp can argue anything but that if he doesn't produce. I mean, that's what he's there for. And and you're like, you're right. He was if he was noticeable the way that he was really early in the season and in preseason, no, then I. I could make that argument. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's it. He just, he just has not really performed. And I guess his camp or he would argue, Hey, the reason why I was frustrated is because every player goes through lulls. And just because I was coming off this great preseason, I still played well in the Montreal game. Um, I'm only getting 10 minutes a night. Uh, I don't feel as though I can get a great impact here. And now you're taking me out. I can't really find my legs. My whole point was that I want to be able to be given the runway of an established player who gets to play 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 games, and then be evaluated, not six or seven before the media and the coaching staff start picking me apart. So I understand it from his perspective. I would just say that where this team's at and the glut that they have, but forward depth, like it's just, it's, it's hard to envision that happening if, and when Cali yarn croak comes back, like all of this stuff doesn't feel complicated. Even the Hawk and Paw stuff to me is fairly simple. Um, you know, it doesn't involve a lot of difficulty, the only problem is that Yarn Croak comes back and all of a sudden it looks like you have a pretty obvious set top nine. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I would say is like, we'll see if Patrick Patrick. is out or not. Yeah. And, and, and Holmberg's the other guy who could come out. Right. So I would give Robertson a little bit more rope here. Like yeah. I, I can, I can see not, not just giving him seven games, like give him, I don't know, 15 or whatever, but mm -hmm. he's, he's got to, he's got to show something more than what he has so far. You know, even, I mean, they've played power play too a little bit more and he hasn't been super dangerous or noticeable there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's, he's, he's got to, I mean, I don't, he can't expect that he's going to get 16 minutes because he hasn't earned them. A hundred percent correct. And uh, all I would say is you're right. I, he have he has to get the leeway. He has to get more games. He's got to get up to that 15, 16, but where they're at in the season, it's like after tonight, you're, you're halfway there, you know, like you're, you're more than halfway there potentially to that real conversation that's going to happen. Okay. So you mentioned the Hawk and Paw thing sort of in passing that he looks close. I think Timmons has played fairly well, but um, pretty clearly you are going to sit him for Hawk and Paw. And I would guess that Hawk and Paw, and this is based on nothing other than my thinking, I haven't heard this from anybody, but that. They wouldn't exactly be, they'd be treating Hawk and Paw kind of similarly to what they did with Pacioretty, which is if there's ever a night they can take him out. Like he's not going to play all of the games that they would try to no. manage the minutes that they would not no. be playing him on back to back. So if you're Connor Timmons, you can't be too upset with it because you're still going to get ice time and you're right behind a guy who's very injury prone. You're the clear seventh defenseman where as you know, a year ago from now, if you could be promised being that on a contender, you would take it in a heartbeat. Um, so that's a kind of a fine sorted situation. But from a cap standpoint, now it feels urgent then when he's coming back to get money off the books because it doesn't work. So do you think the Leafs have a trade lined up for Timothy Lilligren right now? Like, do they have a resolution for when Hawk and Paw comes back for Timothy Lilligren today? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been working on this and talking to teams around the league and I'm getting a lot of teams saying they're not interested. So, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, they, they obviously have something that in their back pocket that they think they can do something have to, I don't, I don't know if that's put guys on waivers or there, there's probably some one of those. I'm not, I don't know if it's Logan for sure. There's gotta be something where they've got, an escape hatch here where they can just disappear one of these contracts. So it could be camp. Maybe there's a team interested in taking camp and the Leafs don't get much in return. Maybe it's Lilgren. You look around the league though. There's not a lot of teams that need a Lilgren. Like it's like, who is the obvious fit for, for him to go to? It's been my point all along. I, I, he's 25 years old and he needs a new contract. Like he's not the young low chip that you're buying for a young rebuilding team. And he's proven himself to not really be a playoff performer. And 
Yeah, I, I like some people are still three higher million. Online. Yeah, that's it's what I mean. Three million. That's I, mean. I mean, that's a teams. When I talk to other teams, it's like it's three. You know, and it's yeah. not just this season; it's next season. And the Leafs aren't going to retain any of that. And it's three million for a guy. And I, I think got two more years left. I thought this was the final year. Of it. No, no, no. It's two years, including this year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I was going to say this is, this is yeah. the last one. Yeah. Because I was going to say that that's part no, of no, it. No, if, no, 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 yeah. no. The two year deal starts this year. Oh, like he really? Just signed it. Ooh. Yeah, Logren Logren just signed the deal in the off season, right? A two year yeah. deal. Yeah, that's not good. So that makes even, it hard, even worse than I thought. It's even harder to trade it. So, yeah, I ask other teams. They're like, "Well, he's not playing. He's played like 13 minutes this season. He's been a healthy scratch. He makes three million. He's mistake prone. He's not big. Why would we want this guy?" So, the only team that might make sense is. Maybe it's Utah with all the injuries that they've had. Yeah. Or or maybe it's a team like San Jose that just like their blue line's terrible and they've got lots of cap space and they're bad and maybe just take a flyer on a guy. But with Utah, their guys are gonna come back this season. Well, Jersey could be out six months, so uh, okay. Oh well, yeah, I guess if that's the one, but ugh. I'd, honestly that's a bad that's a bad deal if that was this off season. I thought it was the one prior that he ended up getting that, which made more sense to me. But yeah, for it to be this one and it's just yeah, that's for no, that. the two years is a problem. I don't know why What's they I mean? didn't just hammer, hammer through. Yeah, I don't know why they just, I mean, they, they could have, there was talk that they weren't going to give him a qualifying offer and then Logan was just going to go for nothing. And they were worried if they didn't sign him, he was going to go to arbitration. He had played almost 20 minutes a game last year with the injuries to, to Klingberg and stuff. They were worried that he could get three and a half, you know, high threes or something in arbitration and they didn't want that. See, this is one of those ones where I... I think about the Toronto market mattering for a player because you wonder, like if they would have just let him go, the people, the backlash that they would have gotten from people going like, how could you just let Timothy Lilligren walk? How could you let Timothy Lilligren yeah. walk? And then you look at it and it's like, because he's not worth anything in the league. Like, that's why, that's why we let him go. And we were capped out and we had other guys that we were bringing in here. Uh, it just, it would have looked bad aesthetically to start. And now it would have been fine and completely understandable. And yet they gave themselves a headache. And I, I actually do. I, I do wonder if this, if that had a factor in that decision-making process of giving him that money. Well, I mean, I think you worry in a situation like that, that you walk from a guy, no qualifying offer first round pick, you know, who played top four minutes for you last year and he goes somewhere else and is good. Then, then you don't look good. So you have to be really confident in your, the, the biggest problem with Will Grin, and everyone could see this coming into the season, is he wasn't going to be a Craig Berube type defenseman. He wasn't going to be, he just wasn't going to fit into the plan. Yeah, but he wasn't so, a Sheldon Keefe type defenseman either. <laughs> well, he did play like 20 sure. minutes a game last yeah, until year. It mattered, I mean, and then they were like, no yeah. more. Yeah. Yeah. Also, well, I'm so tired of the Lilligren thing from the standpoint of this is like his best minutes that we've ever had. And so much of the data collection that people love pumping out there is just like the most heavily sheltered stuff playing with great players on offensive zone draws. Like, yeah, you know who else could do that? Anybody. Well, I mean, except when there were the injuries last year and he was playing, yeah. you know, he, he played quite a bit with McCabe. He played in the top four. He played, you know, there were, I think he played, <clears throat> I remember looking this up. I think he had 20 games last year where he played 21 plus minutes. So there was a stretch there where he did more than that. And the data people will say he looked good in those minutes. Like the, the underlying numbers looked good in when he was doing that. I'd like to give you a conspiracy thought. I think that the data people know that a lot of us don't pay close enough attention and that they've bought so hard into Lilligren that they're feeding us fake numbers. That this is like, like, look at the Lilligren numbers. They're undeniably good. He's amazing. And then I'm like, Oh yeah, I'm not going to go through this. So I'll take your word for it. And I do it. Yeah. I've, I've been looking at I, all of it. Thank and... God you're the auditor. Then you audit this stuff because <laughs> I, I don't have the time for it and I don't believe it. I think, that there's like a conspiracy about the Lilligren stuff. Yes. He's had a couple of like, like minor stretches that have been solid and he's bought other people in to believe it. But overall the body of work, the idea that you're losing something of material consequence here is to me outrageous. I'm sick of talking well, about it, frankly. Like I just want him to go so that I don't ever have to do this anymore. Well, if no team wants him, then he doesn't really have value. And it, he's an interesting, mm-hmm. really interesting situation, you know, honestly. And, mm-hmm. I, I have a hard time at this point seeing him go somewhere else and burn the leaves and make them look bad. Like I don't see some people say like, Oh, look at, look at Forsling or look at, you know, some of these defensemen that, that really weren't anything until they got into their, their late twenties. And I just, I don't see that happening with Lilgren. Yeah. Lilgren's not Larry Murphy. 
Okay. <laughs> this, this, this isn't, this isn't going to be that. In my no, but there's, there's guys like Montour is, who like, yeah. you know, Montour, everyone, he was in Buffalo and everyone's like, this guy's a third pair defenseman. He doesn't matter. And then he goes to Florida and he has like a 70 point season. And it's like, Oh, okay. And there's, or Vince Dunn, Vince Dunn's another guy like St. Louis, you know, under Berube, they thought Vince Dunn was just a third pair guy. Mm -hmm. They let him go in the expansion draft to Seattle and he's a number one defenseman and he's mm -hmm. playing great. So it does happen with defensemen. There are teams that misevaluate and good teams misevaluate players, mm -hmm. but I just, I, I can't, Lilgren's absolute ceiling to me at his very best is going to be probably maybe a number four defenseman, maybe, I'm and, and probably not on a contender. Yeah. That's I, I I'm totally with it. He's just a guy who will have a career, but I don't think it'll be ever be anything overly special. Anyway, you know, you mentioned the camp thing and I was also the, the other takeaway I had from 32 thoughts was this Elliot pointed out all the teams that are already desperate for center mm -hmm. that Calgary wants one. Chicago wants one. Nashville wants one. And my first thought was, Oh, that makes it so much even not like centers who can play in your top six are already in abundance come deadline time, right? Or that they ever go for cheap. Uh, and this seems like it's going to be a thing for the, the Leafs all season long. I, I am, I don't know, maybe you even have thoughts on that too, about Versteeg's idea to try yarn croak, a guy who has played center before, at least give him a shot between Nylander and Domi at some point this season when he does come back. I don't hate it. Um, but I thought, okay, damn, this is going to make it harder for Toronto to find a centerman eventually because they're going to be competing with all these other teams and that the prices are going to go up because other teams are already looking for this, which means it's going to be an all-season-long thing, blah, 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 right? But the other part of it is you got that many teams looking for centers and that they're that desperate for even depth center. Does it bode well for, yeah, the potential of you moving off of camp and actually being able to get something? Like when you're talking about the escape hatch plan, that reading that made me feel maybe a move off of him is more realistic, even if it does actually right now make you a weaker team based on the way that Holmberg's been playing. Yeah. I think that you could, I know camp's got the term left on his deal, mm -hmm. but I think he's got two years after this one at 2.4, but mm -hmm. I think that you could move him. Yeah. There's going to be a team that has cap space that says, you know, 2.4 is a little bit more than what we want to pay him, but on our team, he can probably play some, some third line center. Whereas on the Leafs, he's strictly a fourth line center. And yeah, I think that there's a world where, I mean, worst case scenario, I think if you put, let's put it this way, you put camp on waivers, I think someone claims them. So mm -hmm. like you, there's going to be a, a world where you can move off of that deal. Yeah. The Calgary fit doesn't make sense, especially considering that Elliot outlined that they're really looking for a right-handed centerman to help them. Mm -hmm. with the dots. So it's mm -hmm. like that immediately excludes camp. Like he's not going to be going there that he doesn't fit the profile of what they need. But I actually did think about a team like Nashville where I went, Hmm, you know, that, 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 that could feel like a fit and that could feel like a place where he would wave a no move to, to say, Hey, I'm going to go play with the Nashville predators and get actual ice time and live in a cool city with some of my former teammates. I like I, just feel, I felt like a little bit more of a potential. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think he's got a no trade. I don't know how many teams are on it, but most, I think it's players, 10. most players don't have Nashville on their no trade. So yeah. that's a place that everyone wants to go to. Yeah. Uh, it's just like when you talked about that emergency valve that they need to have, you're right. Like it's obvious. They have to have a way out of this and they've already had they, like, they got to have the plan already in place and no, they might not be the ideal plans, but there's gotta be something. And yeah. What makes more sense moving off of a depth center that you think is overpaid, knowing that you are going to have doer back that you have other guys who can sort of cobble together that role or moving off of the defenseman who has no value and nobody's even willing to take on unless maybe you eat some of the salary, which to them has to be a complete non-starter in any, in any Lilligren negotiation, even if it's a small amount. Yeah. The only thing you could do is take back a bad contract. That's not very big that you can bury in the minors for a year yeah. or something like that. If you know, like, but I just like, I don't know. I've looked at every single team and every team's blue line and even with the injuries and everything. And there's just, there's not a lot of homes for Lilligren right, mm -hmm. right now. So, yeah. Last thing. Do you have a thought on that yarn croc center thing? Eventually again, this is kind of far away. So it seems like dream. Yeah. I haven't been able to stop thinking about it since uh, Versteeg brought it up to me because I went, you know that I don't hate it. He last played center a long time ago. I remember when Didn't they got him in Seattle. Thought, um, pretty sure okay. he did. Yeah. Maybe not that much, but, um, I, you know, he did it in Nashville. Well, I don't know. Was that five or six years ago? Yeah. He's not good on the draw. Like his, his face off percentage is, low forties, I think. And, and I've heard that. I don't think yarn croc, he would prefer to play wing now. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean you can't do it, but I don't mind it. I don't think you're going to put him 
in, in his not his natural position coming off the injury, but maybe it's something they can look at mm. deeper into the season. Yeah. So he's a veteran who's been around, who's, you know, I remember when they, they first signed him, it's like, this guy can play all three forward positions. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't mind trying that, but those are the things he's not good. I think his career faceoff percentage is really, really low. So you'd have to deal with that, especially if you're going to play him in a defensive situation in his own end a lot. Um, and, and the question of, how much has he done it and how much does he want to do it? Mm. Here's what you say to that. Um, it's going to be Craig Brube that asks you. That's the point of Craig Brube. He's like, yo, you're going to play center tonight. And he's like, for sure I am. For sure. Yeah. Like, no, I don't think he's the kind of guy that's going to yeah. rock the yeah, boat and exactly. say no. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If I was the least, by the way, I would just have Craig Brube highlights like running around the facility at all times. <laughs> like I would just have old, like I saw one from that game uh, the with the Ducks where it was like a billion penalty minutes, right? Where it's just like brawl after brawl after brawl. Uh, where the announcer calls J.S. Uh Gigi Gabor, you know that clip? <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's like Brube has two moments in those scrums where he's just flying at somebody trying to kill him, and it's just terrifying. Like the upper Whoa. body and the face and the look he gives is just so, I, like I said, I just, I practice, I'd be like, oh, whoops, we accidentally played Brube's highlights again. <laughs> like, oh, damn it, what why about- did this happen? What about the fight clip? Do you see the fight clip? Like Jody Shelley was on the broadcast on the yeah. Amazon broadcast on Monday and they showed the fight clip and it's like, okay, Jody Shelley was a tough guy. That yeah. would have been, that would have been when he was like 20 years old yeah. and Barube would have been 40 yeah. and Barube is just fighting like a complete maniac. Like yeah. that, that clip was, that was not like a hold on and, no. you know, dancing bears. That was, a, <laughs> that, no. was that was a death, death wish fight. And you know, it's, it's, he's, he's a, He's a tough, tough man. That's for sure. He fought to hurt. Yes. Uh, yeah. He did not fight to tie up and grapple. He fought to leave his mark. Uh, and yeah, that's why I said like I'd play the highlights. All right. Last thing you wrote a piece uh, that the Leafs are close with McCabe, that all the fellas that we're talking about with the contract extensions take a back seat. All right. Cause this one's the real one. This is the one that's happening. You outline this case of what he's going to make. I want you to make it here. But my only thought with it is he is entering his age 32 season. So why rush when you do have a full year uh, that is in front of you right now. And he plays the way he plays. Like it just, to me, there feels like whenever you're doing these negotiation stuff, like when you're trying to buy ahead and you're buying in season, the guys that make more sense to me are like the Matthew Nyes guys where you go, oh, this could actually get better and better and better. I feel like if McCabe is getting a contract extension right now, I don't hate it, but you're clearly buying him at the very pinnacle of whatever his negotiating price could be. I don't think so because okay. you go to July 1 and you can negotiate more because you're on the open market. Some team gets desperate. and they, they Let's say he plays the right side all year and he goes to market and there's two right side defensemen that are UFA. Mm-hmm. Look at the contract that Matt Roy got last year. Like, did anyone yeah. think he he was going to get seven years at close to six million? Mm. No. I mean, no. it's a similar player, other than he's two years younger. I was going to say, how much younger is he? Because I thought it was more, more significant than that. Yeah, he's he's twenty nine. So it's same profile though. Like a you know, like a number three, number four defenseman, good defensively. You know, like physical. You know, those guys tend to get overpaid as free agents. So. I think that the reason you do it now is that McCabe is going to cost more on July one. Huh? So, and I, and I think that he wants to stay. They're having negotiations. I don't think they're being unreasonable. I think he wants basically like market value. Whereas I think the, and the other thing too, is the psychology of it is if it doesn't get done now and you kind of nickel and dime, his camp could just go, you know what? We'll just wait and see yeah. what's, you know, like it's getting close. We'll just wait. We'll play out the, the end of the season and, We'll see what the July one landscape looks like. So, you know, I think there's a window here where the Leafs could get it done if they want to. And if not, it could just be like, eh, let's talk at the end of the season. And what that really means is let's talk in July or June. So. Or it means uh, he dislocates his shoulder and then all of a sudden, it's like, hey, uh, got got, a tree, got any time? Like, yeah, that's, uh, that's. But that's the job security that McCabe gets by yeah. signing now, and that yeah. might mean that you get a little bit lower number. So, yeah. you know, I think the number's probably like $5 million, four years kind of thing. And yeah. but, I, but I think in free agency, he could get another year or two and maybe a little bit more money. Yeah, that's fine. I don't mind it. I'm just making the case. Anyways, James, it's a good piece. I enjoyed reading it. It's up on The Athletic right now. You can go get it there. Thanks for making time as always, buddy. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, thanks. Cheers, pal.